Hello everyone. Welcome back to this first experiments series of videos. Today we're going to explore transistor amplifiers. Specifically, we're going to look at the emitter follower, otherwise known as the common collector amplifier. We'll start with a brief circuit introduction, explore bias calculations, show the performance using a function generator and oscilloscope, Finally, we'll explain some of the next steps you might want to take if you'd like to learn more about this amplifier. Before we start, I should mention that the emitter follower is rarely found in isolation. So we're going to do this in two steps. First, we're going to show a very simple uh, circuit that you could build. Then we're going to show how it can integrate with an amplifier that we built in one of the previous videos, which is linked below. This is the freestanding emitter follower featuring a TIP41 transistor. This is the schematic. You'll notice that the signal generator is capacitively coupled on the input and the load resistor is capacitively coupled as well. To get started with the math, we're going to briefly talk about what's known as bias. Think of biasing as the DC voltages necessary to set the transistor up for operation. For example, in an ideal world, this amplifier would allow an output signal of 15 volts all the way down to negative 15 volts when viewed at the load resistor. In the real world, we're not going to reach those numbers, but we can get relatively close. So in order to do that, one of the first decisions we'll make is that we want this point right here to be approximately 15 volts. Why 15? Because 15 is half of the power supply, which would allow us to swing up to 30 and ideally down to zero. For now, we're going to connect up both of these resistors. So together, these two 1000 ohm resistors give us 500 ohms. And 15, actually the current, the current is therefore 15 volts divided by 500 ohms, which gives us about 30 milliamps. That does present something of a problem because this transistor is going to get hot. In fact, it's going to dissipate 15 times 0 0.03, which is approximately half a watt, which is hot enough that you should consider using a heat sink such as this paper clip, which I've clipped on top of the transistor. You'll also notice that I used two half watt resistors here. That reduces the power dissipation on any single resistor because there's also, between the two of these, another half watt of power dissipation. We do know that there is a voltage drop here of approximately 0 0.7 volts. And we need to select an R1 and an R2 to provide that voltage. As a rule of thumb, we can select these two resistors such that there's one tenth of the current flowing. So if we have 30 milliamps in the emitter, we're going to select this to be 3 milliamps. 30 volts divided by that 3 milliamps gives us 10K total. To simplify this, I've simply selected two 5K resistors. Here's one of the biasing resistors. Here's the other one. And here's the connection to the base. The collector is connected here. And there's another jumper that you can't see, which connects to this point. There's the two 1K resistors. So they're connected like so in parallel. And then we jump her over to the capacitor and finally to our load resistor. While we're here, I should mention that this here is the negative terminal of the capacitor. And this is the negative terminal of the other capacitor. At this point, we're going to fire up the oscilloscope. We are going to look here with channel 1. We are going to look here with channel 2, and we're then going to look here again with channel 2. For this experiment, we're using the Digilent Analog Discovery as a waveform generator, 
and we're using an analog oscilloscope. Currently, you can see that both channels are grounded and the beam has been lowered to the first graticule. This is channel one, and you can see that it's at 510, approximately 15 volts. And here's channel two. You can see that it's slightly less than 15, as to be expected. In fact, it should be approximately 0.6 or 0.7 volts less. And now we'll turn on the function generator. And you can see that the two signals are replicants of each other, with the channel 2 being a slight DC voltage less. Let's move oscilloscope channel 2 to look at the output on the load resistor. Remember that we're DC coupled on channel 2. So our output is centered about ground, which is currently set to that lower graticule. If I were to move the trace up, you should see that the two are identical. So once again, we saw this 0.7 volts difference. And we saw that the output, which was on our load resistor as measured by channel 2, was identical to that which was measured on channel 1. I suppose that's all you need to know about the emitter follower. Except there's one more thing. And that is that the emitter follower is rarely found alone. It's almost always found in conjunction with another amplifier. This would be more appropriate. Here we can see that our emitter follower is directly connected to a common emitter amplifier. If you haven't done so already, I'd encourage you to watch the video that's linked below as it will describe the operation of all of this. The important thing to know is that this circuit is biased to provide approximately 15 volts at this point. Knowing that there's a 0.7 volt difference here, we know that there's approximately 14.3 volts on the emitter. Since our loads are identical to what they were before, we can assume that there's approximately 30 milliamps flowing here with one half watt power dissipation on the transistor. In this picture, we can see the two amplifiers combined. So we have our common emitter amplifier here, and this is the common collector, otherwise known as the emitter follower. The output of the first stage is this line here, which is connected to the base of our output transistor. The output is on the emitter, which is this line here, connecting to both resistors. And I also have another wire back here connecting to the capacitor, which then connects here to our load resistor. As I mentioned, this is a direct coupled amplifier where the output of one stage is connected directly to the other, which means that these resistors here, which bias Q1 along with these resistors, all establish the DC operating point for this output transistor. Another way of saying that is these resistors must be selected so that approximately 15 volts is applied to the base of this transistor. To test this part of the circuit, I've connected oscilloscope channel 1 to the base and oscilloscope channel 2 to the emitter of our emitter follower. Notice that both oscilloscope channels are grounded and they're currently set to the first division. We DC couple channel 1 and we can see that the voltage has risen 5, 10, 15 to perhaps 17 volts. Again that's on the base and now we DC couple channel 2 which is the emitter and you can see that the emitter is slightly less which is exactly what you would expect. 
approximately 0.6 volts for the base emitter uh, voltage drop. We can turn on our function generator and we can see that the output very closely follows the input. In fact, if I adjust channel two ever so slightly, they should be right on top of each other, which implies that we have a faithful reproduction of the signal. At this point, I'm going to move channel two so that it's looking at the 1K load. And then I'm going to AC couple for convenience. We'll move this to the center graticule and then AC couple. Let's go ahead and push this a little harder. We've adjusted the function generator up to two volts. And now I'm going to use the variable control to lower the signal slightly. Based on this, it looks like we're able to produce a maximum of approximately 10 volts peak or 20 volts peak to peak from this particular amplifier. Before we leave, there is something I'd like to show you. What we're gonna do is we're gonna remove one of those 1K emitter resistors and watch what happens. You can see that there's now some distortion in this signal. Based on this observation, we could make a statement that the total output power of the amplifier is somehow related to the quiescent current that's flowing through the transistor which leads us to a few points of further study. If you'd like to continue with this line of experiments, may I recommend you consider the differences between single-ended and push-pull amplifiers. Today, we used a single-ended amplifier and it wasn't terribly efficient. In fact, we had to put a heat sink on top of that TIP41 transistor. Push-pull amplifiers can be better. However, you still have to consider heat dissipation and techniques such as mica spacers or thermal compound to facilitate the transfer of heat from the transistor to the heat sink. You should consider learning more about the classes of amplifiers. So the traditional amplification that you might see in say an audio amplifier are A, A, B, and B. You'll see class C amplifiers used for radio frequency amplifiers. There's also higher efficiency classes. Class D is quite popular today with audio amplifiers. Class E with radio frequency. And class H is a really interesting amplifier, especially when used with audio. At any rate, I thank you for watching this video. Please leave any comments, questions, or concerns in the space below.